Hello again, and welcome to the Quiet Light Podcast. I'm Pat Yates. Today, we have a great episode. It's, it's exciting to talk about accounting. We've got Cindy Thomason from BooksKeep. BooksKeep is a company that helps do your accounting and bookkeeping for your e-commerce business. And they actually operate it from um, a standpoint of profit first, at least for the clients that would use that, which is an interesting book on how to structure your accounting uh, based on different bank accounts. Really kind of deep when people get in there, but it's a cool process and this company really focuses on it. So whether or not you actually need accounting is is up to individual people, but think about this. Whenever you're coming to sell your business with Quiet Light, we always go through the financials first. We try to find ad backs, we try to find mistakes. But if you have $10,000 mistakes somehow, or accrual problems or posting issues or whatever the thing is, and you're selling at three and a half multiple, you just cost yourself $35,000. So the money that you spend transactionally with an accounting firm can go out the window really quickly if it's not uh, put together uh, correctly. The nice thing about Cindy's business is they're sort of giving you a philosophy towards your your bookkeeping and your accounting and how you run your business, as well as giving you that feedback quickly doing the bookkeeping work. I think it's just fascinating how people work and how their mindset is. I'm really excited to talk to her about how Profit First works in with this and how the accounting can change if you work with books, books keep. So as always, if you uh, have any feedback from the show, my name is Pat Yates, and you can email me at pat at quietlight.com. I'm really anxious to get to Cindy Thomason here with Books Keep, so let's get right to it. Cindy, it's great to have you in the Quiet Light podcast today. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Pat. Thanks for having me on. Hey, I'm always anxious to talk to people, especially in accounting. It was one of my classes I hated when I was younger. Like the old school people, like, you know, especially some people may not realize this. There was a time when I had to draw those T graphs. We had to actually draw them out and do all that when we were going through accounting class. I'm dating myself, Cindy. And that's not, uh, not a good idea. It. I still do it. So I'm right there with you. <laughs> Well, anyway, it's great to have you in today. I am so excited to talk to people because I can't tell you how many times I've had clients at Quiet Light that come in and they have all their stuff on a spreadsheet and they have a box of receipts, like, and I mail it to you and all these different things. And they just come in semi-organized or not organized at all. And that's really where people like you come in. So I'd love to hear about you first, personally, and where you're from and tell us all about your company. Okay. Well, um, I live in the middle of the country, uh, north central Arkansas. Uh, honestly, a stone's throw from Missouri. So we're, we're real close to uh, Branson, Missouri, the country entertainment capital. <laughs> um, I have a remote practice. We've been in business since 2014. And um, we got started just because we, honestly, I needed uh, something to do while my daughter was uh, being homeschooled. and. I needed something that was flexible because I needed my time with her. And so from my corporate career, I had done accounting. I, I jumped in here and started doing some work locally. And then I met uh, Mike McCallowitz from Profit First. And he he really kind of guided me to focus on a niche. And so since 2015, I've been focusing on uh, clients in the e-commerce space, helping them get profitable with tools like Profit First, um, and a variety of other cash flow management um, type of um, consulting activities that we do with them. We have a team of about 25. They're distributed all over the U.S. And, um, and yeah, we, we love working with e-commerce businesses. They're kind of like us. They, they, they value their flexibility. They, they, like, uh, they like technology. And so there's a lot that we have in common. That's really good. First of all, the people in Nashville are going to take issue with that uh, comment about Branson, Missouri being the country. I, mean, I used to live in Nashville. There's some people who are pretty fanatical about that. So I think there's some people who might disagree with that. But we're well, going to they got to come out here and check it out, right? <laughs> now, you you mentioned something right away that I'd like you to comment on because this is about you, your company's about bookkeeping, but there's also a philosophy, like I can see it behind you, that you actually mm -hmm. adhere to. And it's really interesting because my dad will tell everyone that profit first is a complete risk off of his budget growing up when he was younger. He used to legitimately keep envelopes. And if there was no cash in the envelope, he didn't do it. My dad talks passionately about that. I think they still do it. He and uh, my stepmother, Sharon, they still do that same kind of thing. So when the money wasn't there, they couldn't spend it. So I think that this, with that's a rudimentary explanation, is really the foundation of what Profit First is about. Tell us about that, because I am still really curious about that and how it'll tie into the book uh, bookkeeping we're talking about later. 
Okay. Well, your your father would be exactly right. It is a complete ripoff, and Mike gives credit to the envelope system in in all his material. Um, I think his grandmother was the one that taught him about it. Um, It's just putting a modern twist on it. We can do that now with bank accounts, and we can do it for our business, not just for our personal lives, which is how most of us are familiar with it. I can't tell you how many people come to me as clients, and we start working together, and they're like, I do this in my personal life. It just never occurred to me to do it for my business. And so it's it's really um, it's really just taking that concept and applying it to business. And here's why it's so important. Uh, Profit First is based on this theory called Parkinson's Law. And Parkinson's Law is uh, you use what you got. You may remember as a kid, uh, maybe you weren't this way, but I was this way. I got a little bit of money in my pocket. And then I couldn't fig- wait to figure out what I could spend it on. And my parents would say, that money's bur- burning a hole in your pocket. And it's yeah. that kind of thing. We start to see money showing up in our one bank account. And we think, oh, things are looking really good. Or if we don't have money, we start to really panic and start to worry. And what Profit First does is it gives us different bank accounts for different purposes. And the one I specifically um find very important for e-commerce clients is a bank account for inventory. Because inventory, most of my clients will buy a big uh, load of inventory, and then they'll sell through that over a period of weeks or months. And then they'll have to come up with another big amount of cash to make a down payment, pay pay it off, and then they'll sell through that. So this inventory um, cash flow is like a lot goes out the door, and then you start to build up some money, and then a lot goes out the door. When all of that money is placed into one bank account, what tends to happen is we start thinking, wow, I'm I'm doing pretty good. I'm making a lot of money. Look, my bank account is big without thinking about in two you know, months, I'm going to have to spend some money to get my next load of inventory here. And so the idea of just segregating that inventory money into a separate bank account so you know what it's for. You're putting money in it based on what you've sold. Um, You know, you can look at your cost of goods sold and know, okay, for this $10,000, I've had $3,000 in product. Put that $3,000 over in that bank account and let that money just continue to grow until you have to replenish and buy more inventory. And that takes out a lot of this up and down uh, craziness that you might be seeing in your bank account with all your OPEX. Your OPEX bank account will make a lot more sense, plus your inventory bank account will make more sense, and you'll just have a better handle on your business. Now, that's just kind of a rudimentary way we do quick start, and there's other accounts that you can use. I've got one client that was with me for a number of years. He sold his business not too long ago, but he was up to 23 bank accounts, and he kind of did use it as a budgeting tool. He said, okay, my advertising budget is, you know, 20%, and he would put that number in, and he could tell when he started spending more on advertising than he was replenishing, He would that would give him a clue, and he would say, huh my advertising is not being as efficient as it was because I'm running out of money now. And if I were selling as my advertising should lead me to do, I ought to be banking a little more money there. So it, it is a budgeting tool. It's also a cash flow management tool. And what's really beautiful about it is you don't have to wait until the end of the month and your bookkeeper gets her uh, reports done or his reports out to you. You know, sometimes that's as much as a month later than when the activity took place you can log into your bank accounts and see your balances and know at that moment how you're doing. So let's do this. You know, I wanted to jump into some accounting, but now you've sort of opened up with Profit First, which opens a whole lot of questions. Now you mentioned, and I understand the concept of being able to have extra bank accounts. And these days it's kind of easy because you can go into the same bank and have like seven or eight sub accounts that you just hit and transfer, take two minutes. So to me, I can see how this is easier than it used to be in the past. But here's the question. Can you give the listeners a little example, like of the guy who had 20 some, that's a pretty complex P&L. But how many do people, let's say if you have a half a million dollar e-com business and you run Amazon, Shopify, everything, how many bank accounts is typical and what do those usually consist of? What what, What are roughly the ones you would set up if you're a base customer? 
Okay. If, if you're primarily an Amazon business, Amazon's collecting all your money, right? They're going to keep it for a couple of weeks and then they'll, they'll send it to you. So if they feel, if they feel in a, they're in a good mood, they'll send it to you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so once that money comes into your account, then we recommend the first account is replenish your inventory account, move that money from your settlement payment over to your inventory, whatever that amount should be. Um, I know we were talking earlier and you're a, you're a middle of the line guy. So you're going to look at your gross margin and know how much your cogs were. And, you, and once you know that, move that over so you can do that again. That's your lifeblood, keeping that business going. Then I recommend people who have an account for profit. And the profit account does a couple of things. One, it ensures that you are profitable. And it's not this paper profit that you might see at the bottom of a p and It's true cash dollars in the bank account that if you have a, a family need, you can take the money out of the business and, and you've got that profit. The other thing is it's starting to build up a little bit of a savings account, a little bit of a rainy day fund. Should something go wrong, you know, maybe Amazon doesn't send you your settlement check as expected, or maybe they've lost your inventory. It gives you that rainy day fund so that you have a little bit of runway to think a little clearer and make better decisions. Then, of course, we have OPEX, which we, we've talked about. Everybody's kind of got this basic checking account where everything runs through. We call that OPEX. And then there's two other accounts. One is for taxes and one is for owner pay. Taxes, of course, is setting aside some money so that come April, you've got money to pay that tax bill for, the, for your business. Because you may be paying estimated taxes along or maybe you're not even doing your bookkeeping along and you just get a surprise uh, come, you know, March or April and your tax uh, accountant tells you you've got a big bill to pay. Well, you right. if you're doing profit first, you're you're preparing for that and you're setting those dollars aside. And then, of course, if you're working in your business, you are your business's most impl important employee. And when things happen, if something you know, made you where you weren't able to work, maybe you got sick or a family member got sick, you would have to turn around and pay somebody else to do the job that you've been doing. So you want to be creating um, some money that would flow to you as an owner um, working in the business, the person working in the business, not the business owner collecting the dividend, so to speak. So those are the main accounts. I mean, it's it's pretty, pretty basic um, accounts that we talk about in, in my book and, and Mike talks about in his book, with the exception, I add inventory into the to the formula because it's just so critical to understand inventory cash flow. That makes a lot of sense. So let me let me back up and give you a practical example. Let's say one month you do a hundred thousand dollars in sales and you already had all your product, you've already bought it and paid for it. And the cost of goods at accrual, let's just say for the sake of saying it, for that month was 30,000. You already had it. So we know the cash basis is zero if, if you'd already, if, if someone's doing that. So are you suggesting that if someone went through that month, that they take that $30,000 accrual amount and transfer that to their cost of goods or whatever you call it for product? We call account? It is, that, is that as simple as you would say it is? It, that's yeah, that's it. That's what it's all about. Just knowing that you've set that money aside so that when you have to replenish that inventory, you're not going to have to rely on saving it in this, you know, one account that you're just kind of thinking, OK, I'm going to buy inventory. It's actually earmarking it, put it somewhere. So, you you know, you're preparing for that next inventory. Okay. buy. That totally Make makes sense. Simple. And the operating expenses, the OPEX, as you're talking about, is any, it's a catch-all for everything. Do you ever segment that? Are there reasons people oh, would yeah. segment it? Oh, yeah. That's where the 23 accounts come in. Um, <clears throat> one account would be advertising. You know, advertising can get, besides inventory, advertising is where a lot of our clients' money goes. So we like to understand how efficient is our advertising? So if you tie a allocation amount in, in the way we do that in um, with advertising is we say, OK, let's come up with a percentage. What's your percentage? Is it 10 percent? Is it 20, 40? What is that number? And then whatever dollars you get in your um, from your payout, let's move that percentage to that advertising account. And yeah. then as you pay for your advertising, you can start to see, am I running out of advertising? Uh, dollars uh, because I'm paying more than I'm getting in to replenish it. 
And if so, that is a big red flag that your advertising is not performing as you expect it to, right? I mean, theoretically, if you're getting the um, the ROAS and, and um, return that you're expecting, you should be getting a return that's actually allowing you to put more in that advertising bucket um, so that it's growing and you theoretically have more money to use for advertising going forward. But if that's not happening, then your advertising dollars aren't working for you like you expect. It's interesting because it really makes sense what you're talking about. The more you think about it, there, you know, it, one, one answer begets another question of how you do this because, you know, companies that are struggling, let's say they're not making money in a month, or if you're seasonal and you're doing a lot of investment of things early in the year, and then you get most of your sales late year, this can be a difficult program to adhere to. I mean, because you either need a bunch of cash that you can put in place to be able to hedge those expenses for when your busy season comes, or you have to start robbing Peter to pay Paul, which is where everyone takes one account and it dwindles down. So, how do you see people handling that kind of situation? I know that's really two scenarios, but yeah. if you're light on cash in a month and you can't just transfer it, how do you see doing it? Do you, does is that where it you see that you're tranching money back into your business and it worries you? What 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 is the outcome when you're you're flipped upside down and can't do it this way? Well, that's where it does fall apart. And that's where you really have to do a deep dive and understand what's going on in your business. Is it because you're starting profit first in the middle of the summer and your busy season happens, you know, from November 1st to, you know, Christmas Day? And at that point in time, you're going to be flush with a bunch of money and then what to do with it? I like to be talking about profit first right now because that is the case for a lot of our clients. And they tend to then just use that money in a variety of different ways, but it's not setting themselves up for avoiding this pitfall in the summer of not having any cash. So let's let's say you're seasonal and you have a great summer season, I mean, a great winter season to, to look forward to. In January 1st, you've got a big payout in your bank account. What we recommend is looking at your profitability for the whole year and setting aside some dollars for those months that are slow that we put in what we call a, a drip account. We put it in this account um, and segregate it. And we know that we're going to pull it out of that drip account whenever things are slow and we're having trouble being able to you know, make the rent or whatever it is that gets hard in the summertime because all our dollars are going to inventory and we just don't have the dollars coming in to keep the business going. And that's where clients end up in debt. Now, there's a different situation you described, and that is maybe you're upside down. Maybe you're um, relying on a lot of debt. Maybe, you're, um, maybe your gross margin is just not high enough to be able to afford all the expenses that you have in your operating expenses. Um, advertising can eat up um, your gross margin in a hurry. Um, looking and getting yourselves in, involved in um, subscriptions and things that are not really bringing a return for you, that can put you in a situation where all your dollars are going out the door and you don't have any to um, put in these buckets. And so what happens is you get the money in, you allocate it, and then a bill comes due and you pull it back. That is the quickest way to, to come away from the situation and say, well, profit first doesn't work because you haven't really addressed the problem in your business because it's pointing to a huge problem in the business, which is you don't have enough of a gross margin to cover what it takes to run your business. And there's a couple of ways we can address that. One way would be, what can we do to beef up this gross margin? Is there some way you can get, you know, um, save on shipping or reduce prices with your um, with your supplier, or perhaps you can raise prices. What are the things you can do at that level? But then there's also look at what you're spending money on and go through an exercise. And, and we try to do this at least four times a year with our clients, where we pull out all their operating expenses and say, all right, what can we cut? You just, you signed up for something, you tried it, it didn't work, but you forgot to cancel it. What are those things? What are those things that maybe there's a, a way that we can replace it with something cheaper or we can um, reduce it? Maybe maybe you got the whiz bang subscription, but you really only need this basic part. Can you cut 
cut back on some of it, and then you're left with those things you can keep. So right. systematically looking at your business, understanding OPEX, understanding how you may be able to make some adjustments so you actually do have the money to put the system into place. I really like that. I mean, when I saw Profit First, I thought this is something that is fantastic in theory. And then it becomes something completely different in practice. I just have this feeling like I know myself and I know how I do things. And, and this this would actually be a really good check and balance for a lot of people in a lot of ways and actually keeps you in a position where you wouldn't be doing anything. But that's this is great information. Obviously, people can pick up a profit first book. And I know that it's the it's the backbone of what you're you're talking about. And what's great about it is no matter who good how good or bad your business is, this sort of gives you a roadmap to how to make it good. It's like it sort of forces you in a position to where you uh you can be successful. So let's talk a little bit more as we go forward. We'll leave profit first there about your company books keep. Obviously, a great company, still hiring people, have a lot of clients. Tell us an overview of what Bookskeep does, your company? We we primarily do bookkeeping from start to finish. So we will um, take on our clients, get them set up with a uh, good uh, chart of accounts and good practices for doing their accounting. And then we do it for them. It's a done for you service. Um, every um, 15th of the month, which just happened yesterday, we make sure that all of our clients get their financials Um so that they have the data that they need to make decisions in case they're not doing profit first. And so they're getting their financials. They're able to understand what's going on. It's, it's more from a management perspective so that they can manage their books um, effectively. Also, you know, we've worked with a number of clients that have sold through Quiet Light, and we know what's expected for a, a successful business sale. And yeah. So we understand the need to have the books uh, organized in a way so that the accounting is done in an accrual basis for uh, at least through the gross margin line. And so that it's so it looks good for a um, for a potential buyer, broker, whatever. Right. Um, and then for clients that are, are you know, really ready to start selling and they're, uh, you know, entertaining offers, that kind of thing, we work with them through that due diligence process to get their um, seller discretionary earnings put uh, segregated on their P&L so that, you know, it's clear what the potential buyer would be um, be looking at from a profitability standpoint. That makes a ton of sense. So. You take the same profit first stuff, you apply it to this and people come in and you help them maintain their accounting. So let's talk a little bit about, let's say like if we're talking about Amazon, it, it just cracks me up every time I have someone come in that posts their actual net deposit number as their top line sales number and they assume that their Amazon is there. And I'm like, no, you've understated your revenue and you've understated your expenses to get to a net number. Talk a little bit about philosophy and things that have to be done, especially for e-com people, because I think this is a big part. People don't understand how to post Amazon and subsequently don't know. And like that, people have different philosophies on Amazon fees. Should they be in cost of goods? Should they be in expenses? Where should it be? Talk a little bit about some of the nuances of Amazon and why it's important if you're an Amazon seller to at least understand these bookkeeping methods if you don't have a company like Bookskeep. Well, one of the biggest things that we see, um, uh, well, there's two. One is, uh, as you described, People come in, they think their uh, deposit is their top line number, and it's not. That's Amazon's already taken out those fees. From our perspective, we put fees in cost of goods sold because you it's not an option. You don't have uh, you don't get to go and say, well, I'm gonna put this off for next month. It's you know, operating expenses. A lot of times we have some flexibility about how we're gonna manage it. These are direct costs to doing business. So we put it in cost of goods sold. The other thing that happens though. And, and everyone should be aware of this. We, we get clients come in and we start working with their tax returns from the prior year to be sure we've got a good starting point. And what is typically, what's a, a typical scenario is their CPA has taken their 1099 from Amazon and used that to book their income for, for the prior year. And the problem with that is that, um, the, the the number that Amazon reports as product sales includes your sales tax. So if you're a very big seller and you've got sales tax being reported out for multiple states, that income is grossed up and you're going to end up paying taxes on something that really was just a pass through number going to your um, 
you know, going to a government agency. You're you're holding it until it gets, uh, you know, until Amazon. Well, actually, you don't even hold it now. Amazon holds it, you know. So it's not something that you even got in your account. But because of the way Amazon books their income, sales tax is included in that product sales number. And if you turn over on the back, it explains all of that on your 1099. But most many CPAs, the ones that we end up working with their books, what we see is that they haven't segregated out that sales tax. And as a result, um, the the client is paying sales tax, uh, paying income tax on revenue that was actually a sales tax item. Well, let me ask you a question about that. So you can see where the sales tax comes in transparently when you got a product sales, sales tax, and a total. Mm-hmm. It, you're saying it doesn't come off any of the expenses on the, the report that you're getting? On the 1099. Amazon lumps your sales that sales tax pass through as an income item on your 1099. It's included in product sales at the end of the year. But what about in your normal monthly reporting? Does yeah, that in the, off the, yeah, in the monthly reporting, it's pulled gotcha. off. But Makes what, sense. what what I'm seeing is that CPAs are or you know tax preparers are taking those 1099s without understanding and looking on the back where it delineates that out. And using that product sales number from the 1099 to um, to put that as an income number on gotcha. their tax gotcha. return. Yeah. So most people, when they come in, I don't know if you do it like this, and, and you may teach me something here. When I get my Amazon statement, I actually just create a journal entry. I show the sales. Then I deduct the advertising to its own line, its fees, Amazon fees. I really don't break them out to another line. And then it gives me a, a net number that's the difference, which I put to a ghost bank account until I get back to where the actual monthly report is posted. And I post it like 1 to 30 or 1 to 31 and then offset is that the kind of process you all use or, or how do you guys post Amazon monthly reporting? We do do it using a tool, A2X um, Accounting. It's a, a software tool that allows us to integrate um, Amazon, Shopify, you know, multiple channels. Um, they connect into those um those different accounts and connect back to the software and then they can post it on an accrual methodology. So our job is really to map it properly, make sure the accounts are connected, make sure it pushes over properly. And then that gives us our accrual entries um, when, when we need to make them throughout the month. That makes great sense. Yeah. So, so when you get into accounting, let, let's let's assume that someone's coming as a brand new client. They have Shopify, they have Amazon, they do eBay, maybe Walmart, a little bit of wholesale. What is the process to work with you guys? Are they just sending you stuff during the month? You'd have an end of month wrap up. You have an interface. Tell me how the client interacts with you. Well, onboarding is a big thing because honestly, getting started right is um, is critically important. So they go through an onboarding process where our um, onboarding specialist understands all of these different accounts. You know, are they do they have enough volume, say, in eBay to justify a subscription to a tool like A2X? Or is that just a passing by thing when maybe they have a return, they sell one a month or something? We can we can do that in a, in a more straightforward manner and save the client a little money. So this onboarding specialist sets up their chart of accounts, uh, connects all of these stores to the um, uh, QuickBooks and the interface, A2X, and... And then she goes through and makes sure everything flows through properly, that we have the proper coding set up. If there's payroll, we get that going. If there's uh, bills that we pay, like through bill.com, we get that going. All of those pieces are set up both working for with the client and for the client, but also setting them up in our internal system so that our bookkeepers, when they start working going forward, they've got everything they need to be able to manage that account smoothly going forward. The onboarding specialist just has a lot more experience in working with um, a number of different accounts, a number of different uh, um, bank accounts, you know, they, they just have seen it all. And so they're the best ones to get things started and moving smoothly. Then the bookkeepers um, take over at that point. Um, once we get everything working like we want it to, we have what's called our first statement review. And um, 
my husband, who's a partner in the business, he will meet with the owner and just go through everything that we've done. Uh, a wow. lot of times there's questions. We just don't quite. We made some assumptions. We want to check it out. We want to be sure we're right. And so that first statement review is critical to knowing that, yeah, we're in good, good position here to move forward. It usually takes us six to eight weeks to get through that. And honestly, inventory is the piece that's a challenge because clients have a um, a struggle keeping up with their inventory. Yeah. So once we get all that dialed in, then it goes into uh, monthly bookkeeping. They're assigned a bookkeeper. That bookkeeper has honestly already started working with our onboarding specialist and starting to help her and learn the account. So they're not like brand new at that point, but they've had sure. somebody to ask questions to as they're getting, you know, getting used to this new account. Then they take over. They do the done for you bookkeeping. They they watch all those bank accounts. They record all those transactions. They push all the stuff from Amazon. And then at the end of the month, they do all the reconciliations. They generate the reports. And then they will meet with the clients every quarter to go over the reports and be sure we're all on the same page and answer any questions. That's really great. So a new client is going to come in and and you guys are basically going to handhold how you set it up. So you'll give feedback like, I don't know why you have five different lines for this. Let's combine it. Let's let's ch- clean your QuickBooks PL up like this. And then the first time you get, you go back and you get feedback on those things as well as maybe some guidance as to how to make it better as you're going forward. That's really good that they get that feedback early. So you mentioned something I do want to make sure everyone out here understands. We have such a big struggle with cash versus accrual in when it comes to cost of goods and inventory. And you just talked about it. It is really one of the biggest struggles. And I'll give you a personal example. I had a business, I won't say who it was, a couple of years ago that he came in and he thought he was making like 300 to 325,000 is what his, his P&L showed. And I went through it and we're going to think about listing. I'm like, something doesn't seem right. You're such a, you're so erratic. And I said, are you on cash basis? Last minute I check on this as we're getting ready to list the business. Turns out he really didn't understand what cash basis or accrual was. He had no idea. Turns out he was on cash basis. It was really kind of understated in the, the P&Ls because you could barely tell it. He went back and did a rework of it and it turned out his ST was like 600000 He sold the business for $2.2 million. So there are a lot of big mistakes here. People that don't understand this out there. I let the accountant, I'm not an accountant, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express one time. That's a shameless plug here on the podcast, by the way, Holiday Inn. But um, I'm just dangerous enough to know how to screw it up. But cash is what when you post it to your P&L, when you pay for it. Like if I buy a thousand units today and they're five bucks, I pull $5,000 today. But if I only sell a hundred of them in the month and they're 500, you're truly supposed to post the 500 and leave the other $4,500 in your asset and inventory account. So maybe you can talk a little bit about the pitfalls and what might be a good thing for people to do, even if they don't have a bookkeeper, they're coming in to see you. You know, if if you're going to just run this business and it's retirement, it's just going to be something you play with until, you know, you decide you can't you know, deal with it anymore, and then you close it down, then do cash. It's easy. But if you're ever going to sell, and if you're really wanting to to grow, you need to understand your profitability. And you need to understand that at the gross margin level. The You can cut all your expenses at the operating expense level, but if you're not making money at the gross margin level, then you don't have a business that's going to support your life or support the growth of the business. So by doing the accounting and an accrual methodology, that's what gives you the visibility into your profitability on a month by month basis. Yeah, over time, cash would work out and you would be able to say, well, sort of towards the end of the year, I can see I made some money. But that's a long time to wait. People that are in this to grow their businesses need to be able to look at their performance from the prior month and understand where their problems are and then make a plan for doing something different. And if you don't understand your accounting at the gross margin level, you're not going to have the data you need to run your business. So to me, that's the number one pitfall. I mean, yeah, uh, down the road for selling, that's a long time off to wait for a payday. But let's manage your business all the way along so that you're not not depending on, you know, your broker helping you solve the problem at at the last minute where, you know, maybe if you had known that all along, you would have run your business different. And who knows, maybe they'd have gotten four million for it because they operated different to create a business that was performing better. 
Right, right. I mean, that's amazing stuff. See, I think the one thing, and and I'm I'm the biggest offender of this, and I can remember so many years where the last thing that I ever wanted to work on were my financials. I just didn't have time for it. I was working on my store, a new product, or whatever it is, and people leave it, and then they binge QuickBooks because it seems easy, but then you're three or four months past it, and you forget a little transaction, and so things are tough. How do you... Um, do your customers uh, work with you? Is it all basically electronic or do you do that one meeting a month when you submit it or do they have a portal? They just go up, late all their invoices. How easy it to work, is it to work with Bookkeep? Well, mostly what we do is uh, we're watching activity come through the bank feed and we can we know when your settlements are. We're connected into Amazon as a uh, admin. So our approach is do as much as, of it as we can without having to bother our clients. At the end of the month, we obviously need some information to be able to get inventory and cost of goods on the books correctly. So at the end of the month, we're interacting more. Um, but if if you're um, you know if you're working on payroll, if you're working with invoices, etc. We can handle all of that through those types of tools. And, uh, you know, it's it's very simple to work with us because uh, those platforms were created with this, this exact model in mind. Um, we use a, a bank account that um, is Relay Bank. I don't know if, if you're familiar with Relay. Relay is it's got a relationship with Profit First. And so we're even able to get into Relay Bank and work with our clients through Relay to manage Profit First so that our clients don't have to work on, um, you know, moving money between their Profit First accounts. So technology's come a long way from the days where we had envelopes and shoeboxes. Wow, that's amazing. You know, it's funny because, you know, when sometimes when people let down their guard and they allow people to come in, because solopreneurs and entrepreneurs in general have a death grip on everything they do. So sometimes it's better to lay this down because not only are you going to get something done that most people don't understand that well, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. And you're going to get quicker and better feedback about where your business is, correct? I mean, I think that this is a positive from many standpoints. Well, we had something happen last week, and this is not the first time it's happened. It's like the fifth or sixth time it's happened, but it's always exciting. We got into a client's Shopify account and we're looking at it and we're like, why is this money sitting out here? Why haven't they taken the money? And, you know, usually Shopify sends you your payouts every every couple of days. Why are they not taking their money? And so we did some digging and we realized that their bank account wasn't connected, that um, this was an acquisition. So this this client had just bought this business had acquired it. The um, seller, of course, disconnected his bank accounts, but something happened when the owner, the new owner, didn't connect his bank account properly. And so the money was just sitting out there. Now, this is at a time when this seller is also working with us because he's cash strapped. He's like, I don't know what happened. Sales have slowed down. He attributed it all to sales slowdown. But in addition to the sales slowdown, the money that he was making was staying at Shopify. And I can't, this has happened multiple times. So an e-commerce bookkeeper, somebody who really knows how these platforms work, can get in there and they can see when things aren't connected and working properly. And so it's, you know, the, the client didn't know this. They thought they had done everything right. And if they hadn't loosened that grip up just a little bit so that we could help them, that $40,000 would have still been sitting there and they would still be working through what what's going on with my cash flow? And yeah. so, you know, there's there's a, a benefit to working with somebody who's used to working with these platforms. And um you, the biggest payout we've ever we've ever found was over a hundred thousand dollars. And it was all we could do. <laughs> my bookkeeper was working um in the evening late. Her she has children at home and um her husband had gotten home from work and she started her day and it was about 11 o'clock at night. And she was so excited. She knew what she had found. She had found this in one other client before and she just she wanted to send the client a message. But she's like, you know, it's midnight his time. I think I should wait. But she woke her husband up and her husband was like, I don't care. <laughs> you know. And so but, you know, that 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 was a pretty exciting day to find one hundred thousand dollars for a client. Wow. 
That's really amazing. It's hard to believe that somebody didn't realize that was coming in. It's just one of those things, but it's always good to have checks and balances. And, you know, that stuff's important. Like, you know, some of the things we're talking about, people think are kind of small, but, you know, I try to explain this to people that if they're accrual cost of goods solely, say you have a million dollar business and somehow it's off by $15,000 in a full year, sounds like a small window. But if you're selling that business for, say, three and a half X, you just cost yourself, what, $57,000. People don't understand that every dime that leaks out when you're not doing good accounting and profit first may be the best way to optimize that. It's definitely going to hurt you in the end. So that feedback is actually probably going to make you money long term if you're looking to sell, correct? That's right. Yeah. I mean, you know, it makes you makes you money at the time you solve the problem. But just think about how that money can then work for you to help you grow your business. I mean, it kind of compounds at that point, because not only did it not go out the door, you were able to put it to work to something that's going to actually grow your business. You know, one of the predetermined things I had in my mind when I was setting up QuickBooks was that I didn't want Shopify and Amazon to be flowing into uh, into QuickBooks because if you try to tie it back to a statement or a pay date, you may not know which ones. It's, it seems to me that was that was something I was concerned about having everything flow in versus pasting it as as full journal entries. What's what's your philosophy when you use A2X? Obviously, it brings in everything. Is that no, a pretty no. easy thing to navigate, or how's it set up? No, it, it does not bring in everything, and that's one reason I love it. And you control what you push. And it pushes into as a journal entry. So you push it and then you like, this isn't right. This mapping is off or whatever. You just delete it, go fix it and push it again. So it it is separated. And um, and all that they push through is the summary data. They do not push in every transaction. And I really strongly recommend you do not want to be pushing every transaction, every order over to QuickBooks. It is it's a cloud system. It does amazing at what it does or in zero too. But every transaction, if you grow and become, you know, a successful business with thousands of orders on a weekly basis or a daily basis for some of our clients, it's just going to slow down that system. And then it makes it impossible to get in there and, and actually do the rudimentary things that you need to do. The data is already saved for you in another system, Amazon. You can always go there and get your data. Shopify, you can always go there and get your data. You just need something to bridge and make it easy for you to bridge that data over into your QuickBooks without bogging down your QuickBooks. So people have the ability to choose whether they're posting it daily or monthly, or does it just automatically do it daily? No, you you set all of that up. You can set it up to post it on a daily or weekly, a um, at the time of settlement. However, however, it makes sense for how you're running your business. Um, the other thing, while we're on this topic, is and, and this is where I see a lot of clients thinking that they're really they're really automating and doing great things. They want to automate and connect their inventory management system or their ERP system into QuickBooks. And I absolutely say, no, do not do that. It is, you would never want your warehouse person to come in and do your accounting in QuickBooks, right? Right. They're worrying about something different, but their ability to go in and adjust orders and information in your ERP or your inventory management system allows that data to go directly into your financial records if you connect it. So we need two numbers at the end of the month about inventory. We can log into your ERP, pull the report, and plug that information QuickBooks with a journal entry. That is infinitely easier to fix if we get it wrong than if somebody on the floor pushes something through and it was incorrect and now your whole ERP system is corrupted and your financial records are too. So it's just, yeah. don't go there. Don't do that. It's a- I agree with that. It's a great check and balance. So I know we're coming close to the end here. And we talked a lot about Profit First, which is amazing. Obviously, people can buy that book on Amazon. I know you have a link on your site as well. Yeah. It's my very book, cool. If I you can probably show have a ton book, of them. So. Actually, pretty sure I have it here somewhere. Okay. Yeah. Mike's book doesn't somewhere. talk about it. inventory. So I-, I the right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I, I, but yeah, it's I a great be- read. I want to be sure people understand the inventory is a little bit different twist than regular profit first. And that's what I try to go into oh, yeah. in my book. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that people get challenged with that, but it's not difficult. I, I find it better to do, you know, either a system that already has your cost of goods in there, you can pull it up or some sort of spreadsheet system that shows your beginning and ending inventory. I'm sure that, you know, if they're working with uh, with you guys at Bookskeep, then you'll teach them how to do that too. So as we wrap up, 
I'm sure we haven't touched on everything with Bookskeep. What what other things can they take advantage of if they come in to work with you guys? Well, unfortunately, this has been a hard year for e-commerce clients. Um, COVID was like everything going gangbusters. And then um, all the government uh, uh, programs for PPP and EIDL, that came into play. Now that money is is starting to disappear and clients are really struggling much more with cash flow and with understanding how their business should operate to be able to be profitable. So uh, we work with clients in our smart CFO program where we take them down a path. We make sure they have a good foundation with their goals and their planning and understand their where they're trying to go. Then we work to be sure their financial data is, is, um, is serving them well. We make sure that their um, their cash flow is working well. Then ultimately get to the point where we can start forecasting. You know, um, looking at your financials kind of looks backwards. Profit first is looking at today, but you also need to be thinking about where you're going and being sure that you're set up for looking into the future. And then what are you doing operationally to, to be successful? How are you managing inventory? Are you, are you correlating your inventory and your advertising to each other so you're not advertising something that you're actually over, out of stock on or in danger of running out of stock? So making sure those things are working operationally. And then finally, getting ready for that exit or expansion, but getting ready now that you've got things optimized, how are you going to grow or is it time to, to exit? So that's the other piece. We've, we've worked for years around profitability ability. And by doing that, we've started to see that it's this path that you go down to get a business that really is going to be um, operating and humming and then set you up to make a successful exit at the end. It's amazing. I mean, anyone out there listening, understand, I, I can I can just tell that if someone's running a business, and they're eventually going to sell, you're going to find a way to get all this money back plus some because they're going to help you get in a position where your expenses, your cost of goods and stuff are in line. It's just amazing that you guys do such a great job doing that. So if someone really wanted to reach out and, and, and reach out to the team at Bookskeep, how do they get in touch with you? Uh, the website, bookskeep.com. So it's B-O-O-K-S in the middle, K-E-E-P.com. Or they can reach out to me direct, directly. It's C-Y-N-D-I, Cindy at bookskeep.com. And I'd love to love to chat with anybody that's listening, see how we could be of help. Well, Cindy, it's been amazing you having in the show today. Obviously, you're a friend of Quiet Light. We've sent a lot of people each way to people. It's always great to have you as a vendor partner. And if you folks out there need help with your accounting, obviously, you have a lot of different resources. It's amazing to me how many people will not do their own legal work. They won't draw their own contracts up, but they'll do their own accounting work. That's an interesting mindset. Most people probably need someone like you, and hopefully everyone will reach out to books. Cindy, it's been great having you on the Quiet Light podcast today. I appreciate you joining us. Thank you, Pat. I've enjoyed visiting with you.